previously on the seventh day. How can we discover the origins of our own experiences? Where or when was our beginning? By creating the Sabbath, God gave human beings an opportunity to emulate him, to enter into his rest. Now, perhaps some of us have been too quick to discard this old book as an irrelevant collection of useless fables and legends, traditions. And now, part two of the seventh day, revelations from the lost pages of history. Notice what Pope John Paul II said in his 1998 apostolic letter entitled Dies Domini. The Sabbath has been interpreted evocatively as a determining element in the kind of sacred architecture of time. It recalls that the universe and history belong to God. John Paul's reference to the sacred architecture of time supports the biblical assertion that the seven-day weekly cycle was designed for us by our Creator. Thus, the week differs from all other units of time. Let's think about the structure of time. Each of us deals with time independently. We each have a past. We each live in an immediate progressing present that we sense is moving quickly or slowly, depending on our age <laughs> and other subjective factors. As for the future, it's a mystery. Your sense of time and mine are different. In order for us to coordinate our activities, we must have external reference points. Now, most of what we need for timekeeping we get from creation. The story defines a day as a period of darkness and light, evening and morning. It is caused by the rotation of the Earth upon its axis. More precise units of time, hours, minutes, and seconds are simply fractions of the day. That's easy. That's easy. The year is the period required for the Earth to orbit the sun. The month, as we know it today, is loosely based on a full cycle of lunar phases, but it's been adjusted to make 12 months equal one year. The week is a different story altogether. At first glance, it's an arbitrary period of time related to no natural phenomenon. The earliest record of the week is found in the literature and archaeology of the ancient Semitic peoples who inhabited southwestern Asia prior to 2000 BC. Now, where did they get the week? <laughs> Was it embedded in their past as a result of the Creator's design? Is the week really an arbitrary artificial unit of time? Astronomer and anthropologist Anthony F. Avini suggests an alternative in his book, The Empires of Time. He reports that some chronobiologists are convinced that the seven-day cycle is designed into our very nature. The seven-day biorhythm in the human body is one of the recent discoveries of modern chronobiology. For example, the probability of rejection of certain organs is now known to peak at weekly intervals following an implant. The widespread acceptance of the seven-day week over thousands of years of history is additional evidence supporting the divine origin of the weekly cycle. But if the week of Genesis has survived the thousands of years since the original creation week, why has recognition of the Creator not been preserved? just as successfully? Well, the book of Genesis provides the answer as to the downfall of the human family. In fact, if you read Genesis 6, 5, you'll see that the Bible says the thoughts of humanity were evil continually. So God decided to clean the world up, sent a flood. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth. 
and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. In spite of this dramatic demonstration of God's power and his displeasure with people not following his way, mankind soon forgot again, and they started to build idols to themselves instead of worshiping God. And the whole idea of the weekly cycle, which showed six days of work and a Sabbath was forgotten. And what mankind did was incorporate the weekly cycle into astrological tables, instead of remembering the God of creation. About 2,000 years before Christ, there lived in the Chaldean city of Ur a man who is claimed by all three of the world's great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, as one of their primary founders. In the biblical account, Abram, later renamed Abraham, is a key player in God's plan to win back the hearts of the human family and revive a knowledge of the Creator. Abraham's religion stood out in sharp contrast to the petty idolatry and trivial superstition of his neighbors. He worshiped the Creator, the transcendent, the invisible God, whose wisdom and power was demonstrated by the very existence of the world itself. He had a religion of faith, not sight. He had a direct relationship with his maker. According to the Old Testament report, the Creator God revealed the principles of his relationship with the human race in Ten Commandments engraved on stone tablets. These commandments were entrusted to Abraham's descendants, the Israelites, as a blessing to share with all nations of the world. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This is by far the longest of the Ten Commandments. It's unique in that it includes the divine credentials declaring the identity of the lawgiver and establishing his authority as creator to command the worship of his creatures. The commandment to observe the Sabbath shows the intimate relationship between God and creation. It shows that God not only creates, not only works to bring everything that is into being, the physical world, the natural world, and all that lives in it. But it also shows that God maintains intimate relationship with creation and steps back to withhold and to take in, as it were, everything that has been created and celebrates and cherishes that which has been created. The Sabbath reveals God's compassion for his creatures. In Exodus 23, verse 12, there's a law regarding the Sabbath, and it says, Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your ass may have rest, and the son of your bondmaid and the alien may be refreshed. So the Sabbath is a gift for God's creatures, not only human beings here, but it's also the ox and the ass, so that they can have rest from their labor that they do during the rest of the week. In the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy, we find the Ten Commandments repeated. This time, the meaning of the Sabbath is enriched by linkage to the deliverance of the nation of Israel from slavery in Egypt. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. We participate in God's redemption, just as the nation of Israel participated in God's redemption, because God has liberated us from something. Now he liberated the ancient Israelites from Egypt, from Pharaoh, this oppressor. 
What God does is to liberate us as individuals from the oppressive power of Satan and from the sin that destroys us. Individuals today are in great need of finding a sanctuary in time, which is what the Sabbath is. We are overburdened and driven by the material world and by our own creativity of material things. And the Sabbath becomes the liberation from things, it becomes the liberation from slavery to objects, to technology, to economics, to all the things that make us work frantically towards producing more and more. Since the seventh day Sabbath has such rich meaning, and since it is part of the Ten Commandments, why is it not more widely observed today? Good question. Especially in view of the widespread recognition that this commandment, along with the rest of the ten, applies not only to the people of Israel, but to the whole human family. As it is the law of nature that in general a due proportion of time be set apart for the worship of God, so in his word, by a positive, moral, and perpetual commandment, binding all men in all ages, he hath particularly appointed one day in seven for a Sabbath to be kept holy unto him. The Sabbath was binding in Eden, and it has been in force ever since. This fourth commandment begins with the word remember, showing that the Sabbath already existed when God wrote this law on the tables of stone at Sinai. How can men claim that this one commandment has been done away with, when they will admit that the other nine are still binding? The Sabbath was made for man, not for the Hebrews, but for all men. The Sabbath commandment reveals to us a picture of a creator who craves a place in the hearts and lives of all his human children. David, the great Israelite king, understood this and instructed his people to spread their knowledge of the creator God to the rest of the world. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name, and let men say among the nations, The Lord reigneth. The Bible makes it clear that the Creator's desire was to attract the whole human family to true religion, true worship, so that all could share in the good things he intended to do for Israel. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. It's not hard to imagine the power of the Sabbath to restore and cement the relationship between the Creator God and His human children. Their devotion to the Sabbath day, their worship and praise and appreciation for His creative power would bind them to their God with ties of love and gratitude. If they continued their heartfelt observance of the Sabbath, they could never forget Him. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. To those who honored the Sabbath of God, the day took on deep personal meaning. The day of rest and worship was an opportunity to know their Creator, who had promised to make them His own holy people. But history records that many of the Israelites didn't take advantage of this opportunity. There's evidence in the prophets, for example, Isaiah, that the Sabbath was poorly observed and neglected. Uh, Nehemiah also refers to that. The people had a problem with this. The reason would be really quite simple. The people lost sight of the Lordship of God. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments and my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. The Sabbath, symbol of Israel's unique relationship with God, the very heart of a creator-oriented worship system, was commonly desecrated. 
Finally, the prophet Jeremiah announced the result of Israel's apostasy. Just imagine the prophet Jeremiah walking up and down the streets of old Jerusalem. It wasn't a happy message that he bore. He warned the people that their city was to be destroyed, their temple destroyed, and that they would be carried away to Babylon to serve the king of Babylon. Seventy years. Nobody listened. From about the year 605 B.C., the armies of Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, repeatedly invaded the Israelite homeland. His army eventually destroyed the capital city of Jerusalem and carried most of the inhabitants into exile. Some of the captives were taken to Babylon, while others were dispersed throughout the empire. And now far from their homeland, far from all that they had held dear, Many of the Jews began to realize that they had made a terrible mistake. Many of them began to realize that they must return to the God of their fathers and the worship of their ancestors. Now, many of these Jews, men of great ability, rose to high position in their foreign lands. Daniel, for example, became the prime minister of the kingdom of Babylon. And when the Medo-Persian Empire took over, he rose to the position of first president of the land. It was Daniel who led Darius the Mede to recognize the God of heaven. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. There is evidence to suggest that the religion of the exiled nation became so well known that it influenced the philosophical and religious movements of the following century. Buddha, Zoroaster, Confucius, and Pythagoras all seem to have adopted elements of the Hebrew religion. For example, although there are no holy days in Buddhism today, evidently Sabbath or Upasatha was a part of that religion early on. The Blessed One established the rule for observance of a Sabbath, and he suggested that at the seventh day meeting, any monk whose conscience troubled him should confess his offense before the assembly of brothers. Arthur Lloyd, in his book, The Creed of Half Japan, states that the order of monks kept their Sabbath days for many centuries. Even Confucius may well have been reporting about the Seventh-day Sabbath in this passage from one of his classical works. The ancient kings on this culminating day closed their gates, the merchants did not travel, and the princes did not inspect their domains. Some knowledge of the weekly Sabbath eventually found its way into numerous cultures. In the Hebrew language, the name of each day shows its relationship to the Sabbath. The first day is called Echad Bishabbat, one accompanying or along with the Sabbath. Each succeeding day proceeds toward the Sabbath until the sixth day, which is called Eve of the Holy Sabbath. Day seven then is Sabbath. In more than 100 ancient and modern languages, the seventh day of the weekly cycle was named Sabbath or its equivalent. So it seems that in their exile, at least some of the Jews succeeded where their nation had failed during times of peace and prosperity. They spread the knowledge of God and his law among other nations. But what would happen when these captives returned to their homeland? Would they maintain the worship of the true God? or would they revert to the practices of previous generations? We find an answer in the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah did not return to Jerusalem when the others went, but when one came telling the state of affairs, this news so saddened Nehemiah that he says, he actually sat down and wept. In fact, he finally decided that he must, if possible, go to Jerusalem himself to see what he could do to help. 
Nehemiah was a capable and energetic leader. He successfully directed the reconstruction in the city of Jerusalem, but he didn't stop there. He was a zealous reformer with a burden for restoring the spiritual life of his people because he saw Sabbath breaking as a reason for the years of captivity, he was particularly devoted to preserving the sanctity of the holy day. He discovered that the people were buying and selling on the Sabbath day. Well, he said, we can't do this sort of thing. This is the reason why we were sent into captivity. And when the merchants still continued to come, he ordered the gates barred on the Sabbath day. And when they still continued to come and camp outside the gates of the city, he threatened to have them arrested. A priest named Ezra assisted Nehemiah in his work. He exerted a strong influence on the spiritual life of the Jews of his day. Ezra taught the people God's laws and led a spiritual revival and reformation based on the inspired scriptures. The people joined together in a solemn oath to obey the commandments that God had given through Moses. They promised not to desecrate the Sabbath by entering into commerce on that day. They observed the holy day so carefully and consistently that Sabbath keeping became a distinctive characteristic of their nation. During the period between the end of the Bible's Old Testament record and the beginning of the story of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, there was almost continual upheaval in the Middle East. The armies of Alexander the Great overran the Persian Empire. Within a short time, Alexander himself died, and his empire broke up into rival factions. Palestine, along with Syria, eventually came under the rule of the Seleucid dynasty. King Antiochus IV is notable especially because of his opposition to the religion of the Jews. His troops took over the temple in Jerusalem and set up a system of pagan worship in its courts. Josephus, the famous chronicler of Jewish history, tells us that Antiochus tried to stamp out all visible evidence of the Jews' spiritual identity. So he sent emissaries to Jerusalem declaring, they must tear down the altar of Jehovah. They must give up the worship of the Sabbath. So they gathered themselves together, fled to the wilderness, and there they found a cave that could accommodate their numbers of about a thousand. Now when it was told the king's servants that certain men who had broken the king's commandment were gone down into the secret places in the wilderness, they pursued after them a great number, and having overtaken them, they camped against them, and made war against them on the Sabbath day. And they said unto them, Come forth, and ye shall live. But they said, We will not come forth, neither will we do the king's commandment to profane the Sabbath day. And they burnt them as they were in the caves, because they were not willing to break in upon the honor they owed the Sabbath, even in such distresses. There were about a thousand with their wives and children, who were smothered and died in these caves. The martyrdom of those Jewish patriots in the days of Antiochus IV is a great testimony to the power of their beliefs. Their God in his Sabbath meant more to them than life itself. Their sacrifice was a victory of faith. The Old Testament, supported by the evidence of history, language, and culture, establishes the Sabbath as a sacred memorial to the creative and redemptive work of God. It declares the Sabbath to be a sign of the intimate relationship between the Creator and those who worship Him, a day of rest and worship that can bind the hearts of human beings to the heart of their Creator. When early Christians inherited the Sabbath, the teachings of Jesus Christ and his disciples serve to emphasize and enrich its meaning, magnifying its importance. Today, for many Jews and Christians alike, it is still a central point of spiritual life and worship. To this day, it remains a defining element in the sacred architecture of time. 
Next time on the seventh day. The Jewish way of Sabbath keeping was very legalistic. You couldn't move, you couldn't do anything. He said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The religious leaders were angry with Jesus for healing on the Sabbath, and they continued to conspire against him. Titus laid siege to the city, and finally in 70 AD, the Roman army broke through the defenses, ravaged the city, and completely destroyed the temple.